Our second scripture reading this evening comes from the Gospel according to Luke, the second chapter, verses 1 through 20. Listen, hear, and receive God's word. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to, to, to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom God favors. When the angels had left them and gone into the heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary, she treasured all of these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Every year, pastors, preachers, proclaimers of the gospel are challenged to tell the story of Jesus' birth in new and profound words and ways. We pray, meditate on, and reread those familiar passages repeatedly, searching for a nugget of inspiration that will faithfully impart a word that will edify and encourage everyone, expectantly waiting on Christmas Eve. All of you who have come to sing familiar hymns, to experience the grandiosity of the music, and once again, hear the retelling of Jesus' birth. As I read and meditated on the first 20 verses of the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke, I was struck by the simplicity and how matter-of-fact Luke was when he told the story of Jesus' birth. And then suddenly, Spirit drew my attention to the first chapter of the Gospel, specifically to the salutation where Luke wrote, since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they have been handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after carefully investigating everything from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, so that you may know the truth. So Luke, a physician and follower of Christ, presents an orderly account of the truth of Jesus' birth from his perspective. Luke writes that to comply with the decree from the Roman Empire that all the inhabitants of the world register in the census, 
Joseph of Nazareth in Galilee traveled to Bethlehem, the city of his ancestors, and his fiancee Mary, a young and pregnant woman, journeyed with him. I'm sure that if Luke had been available and consulted as a physician, he would have advised Mary not to take this dangerous journey so close to giving birth. You see, the road from Nazareth to Bethlehem ran along the flat line lands of the Jordan River, and then it turned westward over the hills surrounding Jerusalem. It was a difficult trip. However, I suspect it took Mary and Joseph more than four days, which was the normal amount of time that it took to, uh, to travel to Bethlehem, as they had to take their time over the rough terrain due to Mary's pregnancy. And arriving in Jerusalem, I assume that all the proper rooms in the inn were occupied by others that had come from near and far to register in the census. Mary and Joseph were then ushered to the bottom floor of the inn, the place where animals were typically lodged during their owner's stay. As I wrote this sermon, I reflected on the children who have been displaced by the ongoing war in the Palestinian territory of Gaza. I sadly recalled the evening news a few days ago that depicted premature babies lying closely together on a makeshift bed, keeping one another warm as they no longer had incubators nor the safety of the hospital that had been destroyed by missiles. I'm reminded of pregnant women in this country who do not have access to affordable pre- and post- or postnatal care, and women of color who do not receive the same medical care, and as a result, they have a higher mortality rate during childbirth. My mind ponders all the children in this country born into poverty, and insufficiency, without a just or adequate place to call home. They do not have access to appropriate nutrition, education, social and or emotional support. And then I am reminded of children who are traveling through the desert as their mothers and fathers seek exile and safety in this country. And when they arrive here, they are greeted with contempt hatred, bigotry, and told there is no room for you here. Commentator Cynthia Rigby writes, a travel-weary couple gives birth to a baby and lays him in a manger. That which is ordinary fills the room. Sweat and blood, makeshift blankets and diapers, the raw immediate joy that comes with new life. Mary swaddles her newborn son in the strips of cloth to keep him warm and to help him with his physical development. And then she lays her son, the bread of life, in a feeding trough typically used to feed farm animals. One commentator writes, many of the circumstances that Jesus is born into will accompany him his entire life. He will be implicated in scandals for associating with the wrong people. He will never be rich. He will be hounded. And in the shadow of the empire, he will rely on the hospitality of others to have a place to lay down and sleep. The circumstances of Jesus' birth provide the tenor of his life. End of quote. On that ordinary night, shepherds were going about their routine in the field, tending their sheep. And the angel of the Lord suddenly appeared and the glory of God shone all around them. And the shepherds were terrified, and rightly so. But the angel said to them, be not afraid, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. You see, this was controversial that the angel showed up to talk to shepherds. They were outcast. 
They were despised, considered unclean, second class, and untrustworthy. And it was to these ordinary shepherds that the announcement of the birth of the Messiah was first made. Lost the page here somewhere. It was to these very people who were despised by society, who were considered less than, that God first appeared and that God used to share the news with Mary and Joseph. And so, ordinary things happen in extraordinary ways because, you see, God uses ordinary people in God's service. It is extraordinary that on Christmas Eve, two women of color, one who is a child of this church and another who has served this community for years and years stand before you to deliver the good news. Why? Because God uses or the ordinary to do the extraordinary. So on this day, as we worship and celebrate the newborn Christ, we do so with love and passion. We do so as people who are ordinary but who serve an extraordinary God, who loves us beyond measure. An extraordinary God who gives us hope in places that are hopeless. An extraordinary God that is gracious and merciful and forgives us when we do things that grieve God's heart. So on this night, let us be gracious and thankful and praise that extraordinary God that loved us so much, loved us so much that God put on flesh and came to dwell among us and called us extraordinary because we belong to God. May you leave from this place better than you came. May you leave from this place accepting your place in the kingdom of God as people that God has called to share an extraordinary message. May it be so. Amen.